Rapid and reliable answers from diagnostic tests enhance treatment and infection prevention efforts. Cepheia delivers fast and accurate results that help prevent the spread of infectious organisms, track resistant bacteria, and improve antibiotic utilization and stewardship. To learn more, click on the Cepheia logo on this podcast page. You're listening to The Five Second Rule, brought to you by APIC, the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. Together with our nearly 16,000 members, we strive to create a safer world through the prevention of infection. Join us while we talk to infection preventionists and other experts to learn the truth about some common myths related to the risk of infection and to get tips to keep yourself and the people around you safe from infection. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Apex The Five Second Rule. I'm Sylvia Cuevedo, your host. And today's episode is really an important one. So if you're listening, make sure you share this with friends, family, and colleagues. Today, we're going to tackle tuberculosis. That's right, TB. For many of us in the United States, we don't even think about it, but it is an incredibly challenging disease around the world and something that we here in the U.S. do need to think about and manage. And so to help us understand more about TB, we have Maureen Murphy-Weiss. She is the director of the Ben Franklin Tuberculosis Program with the Columbus, Ohio Public Health Department. Hi, Maureen. Hi. Thank you so much for inviting me, Sylvia. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to your listeners. You know, this is perfect timing having you, Maureen, to talk about tuberculosis because March 24th is World TB Day. I want to tell everybody uh, a little bit about you. You started out in local public health and then you, you moved on to the Ohio State Health Department. From 2003 to 2016, you filled a lot of leadership positions, including the state TB controller position, and you were also manager for the viral hepatitis and healthcare-associated infection program. So I know you know a lot about TB and managing uh, infectious disease. The other cool thing about you, Maureen, is that you are the immediate past president of the National TB Nurse Coalition, and you currently serve on the National Work Group for Issues Pertaining to Tuberculosis Prevention and COVID-19. So we're excited to have you on on an episode. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about tuberculosis, which really has been my passion and my primary focus throughout my career in public health. Maureen, I feel like a lot of people listening may not know a lot about TB. So I just want to share some facts and I'm getting these straight off the World Health Organization, the WHO, facts um, related to tuberculosis. So I'm I'm just going to throw out some numbers that might be interesting to our listeners. I know they were interesting to me. So according to the World Health Organization, a total of 1.5 million people died from tuberculosis in 2020. Worldwide, TB is the 13th leading cause of death and the second leading infectious killer after COVID-19 above HIV AIDS. In 2020, an estimated 10 million people fell ill with TB and 5.6 million were men, 3.3 million were women, and 1.1 million were children. So, you know, these are staggering and tragic numbers. Um, the other thing to say about TB, and I think I think we're going to get into this in more detail, is that it is prevalent in in some of our poorer countries around the world, um, and and among those, um, thirty high TB burden countries accounted for eighty six percent of the new cases, and it says here eight countries account for two thirds of the total. So that includes India, Pakistan, Nigeria, Bangladesh, the Philippines, et cetera. I point this out because this is a disease of the poor. 
And I think it can be, oh, misunderstood or discounted in, in a country like ours. So I want to get into that with you. But those are some staggering numbers. Did you know that? Did, did that surprise you at all, Maureen? No, it really didn't. As I mentioned, this has really been the focus of my work for over 20 years. And it's always remarkable to me that tuberculosis is perceived, at least in this country, as a disease of historical significance rather than an, any impact today. And that's simply not true. As you mentioned, the burden of tuberculosis is much higher abroad, particularly in developing countries. In the continent of Africa, their reporting in 2020 was for 226 cases of tuberculosis for every 100,000 people. As compared to the United States, where we report 2.2 cases, that's two people, a little over two people per 100,000. Remarkable difference wow. here. And that really can be attributed in large part to a stable infrastructure for public health starting in the early 1900s um, and to some degree today. And we can talk about that in a little bit about the challenges of TB prevention and control in the United States. So Maureen, I feel like, and that's, that is, that's a crazy difference between, you know, what you quoted for, for Africa versus here, but maybe uh, before we get into it, because there's so much to talk about, let's, what, what is tuberculosis? Sure. So tuberculosis is a bacteria, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and this particular organism has been with human beings for many thousands of years. Uh, they've been able to identify this organism in mummies 5,000 years old. So we do know it's been with us. There are many references to tuberculosis in historical documents, um, Tiny Tim and Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol had tuberculosis of the spine. So there are lots of explicit and not quite so explicit references to TB. And as I mentioned, it has been with us for many thousands of years. It was not until 1882 that the actual organism was first identified by Dr. Robert Koch. So that's interesting, Maureen. I'm going to quiz you a little bit. Fun factoids. What are some historical names for tuberculosis? Historically, you can see references to the white plague. And in Appalachian sections of the United States, consumption was a common term used to describe tuberculosis disease. Oh, so you do know. Yeah. I've also heard some other ones like King's Touch and Scrofula. So... I think that's important because, you know, you watch old movies or as you reference Charles Dickens, you know, TB has been around and it's been called different names throughout history. And, and many people have had it. I've even had a family member that, you know, went to a, was it a sanatorium back in the day? They would send you off if you had TB. They did. And many of those institutions were open until the 1970s. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. So, um, so we've, <laughs> we've sort of set the stage that this bacteria has been with human populations for thousands of years. It has been known by many names. It's referenced significantly in literature and in film. Um, but it's a serious disease that, you know, as we started out sharing impacts millions of people worldwide. Maureen, talk to us a little bit about how you get TB and um, how it's treated, because here's, here's the real tragedy. TB is preventable and it's treatable, correct? For the most part, yes, that's true. Talk to us about transmission. How do you get it? So tuberculosis is an airborne infection. And I think the last two years has really educated the public throughout the world on airborne transmission of infectious diseases and N95 respirators, which was not something readily known to most people prior to uh, the pandemic with COVID-19. Tuberculosis is not spread through touching surfaces, unlike other infections like COVID-19 and actually other viruses. So you do have to breathe in the air of someone that has tuberculosis 
tuberculosis in their lungs or permanent pulmonary tuberculosis is how that's referred to. Uh, you can get tuberculosis any place in your body. Once you breathe that bacterium in, it can become a bloodborne infection. It can travel through the lymphatic system and cause infection anywhere. As you mentioned a moment ago about scrofula, that actually is tuberculosis of the lymph nodes, and that is in the neck. So TB is transmitted through the air. It's breathed in by the person that is in close proximity, which is why we see increased numbers in developing countries where you have large numbers of people living together in close quarters. The same can be said in the United States for prison populations and nursing homes. Wow. And so a couple of just basics. Um, what are some of the symptoms that, I mean, they might not be, you know, they might be broad or or vague, right? But how do you diagnose TB? Diagnosing tuberculosis in the United States can be quite tricky because some early onset of symptoms can mimic many other diseases. Night sweats, fatigue, just generally feeling bad, um, aches and pains, of course, throughout any place in the body that can come with um, exhaustion, fevers, particularly at night. The night sweats are often drenching night sweats, which is very different than um, someone just having chills, let's say. I think the thing that most people think about when they look at symptoms for TB, they think of bloody coughs or hemoptysis where the person is coughing up blood. And that is not at all uncommon with pulmonary disease, particularly people that have delayed diagnosis. So they're quite sick. They will start exhibiting symptoms like that. I think the one that we see frequently here in the US is profound weight loss without trying, persistent cough, and fatigue. Okay. So Everybody knows um, now, okay, we know what TB is. We know how it's transmitted. We know some of the, some of the symptoms. What are the, the current treatments available to TB patients? Globally, the treatment for TB is pretty standard of a cocktail of four different antibiotics that are pretty specific. And those medications are prescribed for a minimum of six months, depending upon the extent of the person's disease at diagnosis and other health issues that are going on, they can be on treatment for up to two years if there's a drug uh, resistant organism. Wow. That's, that's pretty, that's a challenging treatment regimen. So let me, Maureen, getting back to, cause you, you, you alluded to this and referenced this, you know, there, we, we hear in the, in the medical infection prevention epidemiology news and literature of multi-drug resistant TB. There's also in the United States and in, in, in shall we say, wealthier countries, an association uh, between TB and the HIV epidemic. So can you shed a little light for us on that? Yeah, I can. Globally, HIV TB co-infection is a huge problem. In the United States, it, it is a problem, and I don't want to minimize that. It has become less of a problem in the United States. I don't want to minimize that co-infection HIV TB. It's very serious. It's difficult to treat. We do not see the mortality rates like we did in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, we're pulled into this area of work early in the HIV epidemic. I can say that that's true for myself. I started in sexual health and transitioned to tuberculosis work from there. And early on, many of my patients had HIV and tuberculosis. That's at least in the Midwest and most parts of the United States. That's not so much the case any longer. There are individuals certainly that are co-infected with HIV, but I would estimate that at least in Ohio, it's usually around 10% or less. So that sounds like, I mean, we know incredible 
incredible improvements in HIV treatment, um, and certainly in what we call the first world. Some have even argued this might be considered a, you know, a chronic disease, not to minimize the impact of HIV worldwide. But I think it's important to point out when people do hear about TB currently, there's sometimes that association. And from a public health perspective, you know, it is important to understand that multi- drug resistant organisms are a challenge and they're a big challenge for tuberculosis. That's certainly true. When we look at parts of the world where there's instability in governments, we know that getting treatment to people, and keep in mind, this can be up to two years of treatment, getting them the drugs that they so desperately need for cure over a long period of time in places where there is instability and war can be quite challenging. Clearly, COVID-19 has created circumstances in which people have very delayed doses and interruptions in that treatment. With those interruptions, we anticipate seeing an uptick in the number of people diagnosed with drug-resistant tuberculosis, whether that's mono-resistance or multi-drug resistance is yet to be seen. Wow. As if COVID-19 pandemic, you know, it's like the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> so, so now, I mean, I, I think that's important. And I think from a public health perspective, educating everyone that, you know, the pandemic has impacted every aspect of lives across, across the planet, frankly. Um, and if you were in a, if you were trying to get treatment and that was delayed, that also impacts obviously your individual health and well-being. But, you know, Maureen, would you say that it, it, it creates resistance and it also creates um, transmission, right? So, Yes, interruptions to treatment. So if someone started treatment and that treatment is interrupted is most likely contributor to drug resistance. Late to diagnosis is really what we're seeing in large part in the United States meaning that historically someone may have been identified up several months prior to when they were identified. And that can be attributed to afraid to leave their home during the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. Reduced number of visits, people were not wanting to go to the emergency departments unless they absolutely had to. And they did wait. Just here in Columbus, Ohio, the first year of the pandemic, we had six patients die from tuberculosis and COVID-19 co-infection. Wow. That's that's terrible. Let me it is. Let me get to something uh, because certainly our healthcare workers, our infection preventionists are engaged with uh, you know, this trying to manage healthcare workers. And we know that, and, and I certainly recall this in when, when I was working in healthcare, you know, we have to screen healthcare workers for TB. And there's some new guidance around that, that, you know, took people, I think, early on by surprise. But before we get into those details, can you break down for us latent TB? So help us understand, and, and I'm a little ignorant to this as well, it is possible to be infected with TB and not be sick or not be infectious. Did I get that right? You did get that right. As I mentioned earlier, when someone breathes in the bacterium, mycobacterium tuberculosis, it enters into the lungs. If it is a healthy person and they have a healthy immune system, they mount a response that really keeps that bacteria in check. And it can be dormant or in a latent stage. For many years, 90% of the people that are infected live their entire lives without ever getting sick with active or TB disease. And in its late, latent period, it's not transmissible to others. So those 10% that do progress to active TB or TB disease are the individuals that are most likely to transmit to others. Okay, say that again. The people that are sick with TB disease are the ones that are able to transmit to others. So of the 
90% that are infected with this organism, they never get sick. They're not contagious. They're not a threat to the public's health or the health of individuals around them. It's that 10% that do go on to experience tuberculosis disease or what we call in some cases active TB of the lungs. Those individuals are infectious and are able to transmit to those around them. Okay, because I that's a, that's an important distinction, and it's particularly relevant when we talk about healthcare workers. So I want to jump into because I know our colleagues listening that are not only IPs but our nurses, our doctors, our nutritionists, our therapists, etc. Talk to us about some of the tests that are currently available to screen for TB in the health setting in the United States. Some of the controversy. Um, around healthcare worker screening and testing, and talk to us about that because that's that's a big topic that um, our infection prevention community um, is interested in. It when the guidelines changed, it really did send a lot of people into uh, um, states of confusion, if you will. So for those of us that have worked in healthcare for more than a couple of decades, we remember getting a skin test at the time of hire usually, and they do a two-step. So you're tested, you go in and have your skin test read three days later, and then you come back in 21 days and have a second test placed, and then you go back in three more days and they read it. So that is a 21-day process if you are lucky to complete that two-step at hire. Subsequent to that, healthcare workers were tested annually by their institution. And if there were a large number of conversions from negative to positive, that was used as the sentinel event where you needed to look for an active case of TB in your institution. And so... I, I kind of remember this, that what was it, the MAN2 tuberculin test where you, you know, they inject something in your forearm and then you go back in three days and they read it. Right. And that was done annually. It was. And we have moved away from that. So if you conceptualize TB testing of healthcare workers annually as a way to conduct surveillance for TB disease transmission. You would expect to see people that are tested one year convert from negative to positive the following year. As I mentioned at the start of today's discussion, the case rates for TB in the United States are very low. We are not identifying ongoing transmission in healthcare institutions through the exercise of annual skin test or testing using any mode of testing. It is not something that's really helping us identify and mitigate transmission among healthcare workers. That being said, the guidelines do rely heavily on the community in which you work or where that institution is located. So it's pretty universal in the United States that healthcare workers are tested, whether it's the two-step man two test or the blood assay that's now available um, upon hire. So that testing is done. And repeat testing in most places in central United States where um, rates are relatively low only happens if there's a known exposure. That is not true for states on either coast, New York City, of course, and California and up the East Coast and down in Texas um, or the Southwest. They have much higher rates of TB than we do in central parts of the Midwest, let's say. So it's imperative that infection preventionists are familiar with the epidemiology of TB in their given community. So as they're putting together their plan, They will not only look at the United States case rates, they'll look at the state in which they live and their local community. They'll also look at the number of cases of tuberculosis identified in their institution in the previous year. So there's a lot of variables that come into play. There is um, different tools that can be used to help calculate that. So that's that's there's some good news there that we know that TB is not being transmitted at 
any alarming rate within healthcare and that the guidelines were adjusted such that those institutions could look at their local epi or the epidemiology in their community and make decisions uh, based on that, as opposed to a blanket every year, everybody getting screened. And, And that's important because of the burden that it placed on institutions and on our occupational health colleagues, you know, to manage that. And I certainly remember I mean, it sounds silly, but it was onerous. It's like, oh God, I got to get my TB, you know. Um, It was a cumbersome process. And I think anybody in occupational health that's responsible for that can attest to the record keeping and just the time and the expense that it takes to place a skin test, to read a skin test. One of the unintended consequences of declining TB case rates, and now the move to blood assays to replace the Mantu skin test, is that test is not as easily planted and read as one would think. So there is expertise and practice that come into play. If it is a test that you're conducting infrequently, there is a question about the reliability of that test result from the skin test, simply because user error, we're human, right? So we can have problems there. But we also know from the U.S. data that the positive predictive value of a skin test in a U.S.-born person is about 50%. In other words, if you have a positive skin test in someone that's born in the United States that has no risk for TB other than the fact that they're a healthcare worker, the reliability of that positive test is about 50%. As opposed, right. So that technology first started shortly after Dr. Koch identified this bacterium. So the, while the test was refined over the last century, it is technology that first came about close to a century ago versus the blood assay, which really had been implemented starting in 2005 was when it was first approved, 2008, it started to become used more. Here in Columbus, Ohio, at Columbus Public Health, we do interferon gamma release uh, assay testing exclusively, unless there is some compelling reason, which there rarely is, to use a skin test. We have found that our positivity rates and the people that we test is much more reliable. We have far fewer positive tests and across the board, U.S. and non-U.S. born persons. And we have taken out of the equation for our persons that were born in countries where TB is endemic. There is a, a belief in many populations that skin tests are not reliable because of a vaccine that is given in childhood in many of those countries, BCG vaccine. Right. The blood assay takes that out of the equation. So it's not a confounder. If someone has a positive um, interferon gamma release assay, then that person is much more likely to accept that result. But more importantly, they're more inclined to take treatment to prevent disease in the future. So, uh, you know, that's good to know. And I know that these conversations are, you know, ongoing in the community around, um, you know, what are the best tests in healthcare. But, you know, I think it's fair to say that in the United States and in the developing world, while TB, you know, is, you know, we don't walk around concerned that we're going to get TB and yet it is highly transmissible. And it's, you know, as you said, we're seeing an uptick as a, as a result of the global pandemic. And so it is important to, to just understand that it's still around, it's still with us. Um, But I want to get to something that, you know, let's just talk about, you know, TB is, we can diagnose it. We can treat it. It's been with us for a long, long time. Why do we still have these crazy numbers around the world? I mean, it seems like tuberculosis, dare we say it, is the poster child for health inequity. Um, You know, I've been to some talks over the past few years where some tuberculosis researchers and clinicians are pleading with governments to to address the scourge that is TB. I think that's right. Um, Tuberculosis has become a disease that primarily impacts populations in developing countries, which are minority populations. 
we know that research and development dollars heavily come from the United States and Western Europe. And those are the populations that are paying the taxes to governments that allocate funds for research, development, and implementation of any kind of treatment or mass vaccination. I think that um, there's a lot of optimism. Believe it or not, there has been some positives that have come out of the pandemic and that mRNA vaccines are being evaluated for use for a TB vaccine, which we do not have. That is exciting. Um, so so let me go. Well, of course, populations, let me go back because they're not minority. I mean, if you're, they might be minority populations within the U.S., but but as you said, you know, where the research dollars go is not to some of these places where where this is endemic. Although, as you said, there's been a lot of negativity with the global pandemic, but some positives as well. And so it is exciting to, to contemplate the possibility of a vaccine. I do want to point out that um, the World Health Organization has targeted 2030 as, as an end to TB. So it is among the health targets for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. So that I think is important. It's been um, lifted up um, to say we, you know, we've got to end TB. So I think that that's positive as well. It is. It's a very ambitious goal. It is ambitious, but you know, go big or go home, right? Reach for the stars. Maureen, what have you seen or what are the impacts of the global COVID-19 pandemic on the management of tuberculosis? I think it's created many challenges for a number of reasons. Early on, when governments and uh, public health institutions were standing up their response, so to speak, tuberculosis programs were heavily um, impacted by being pulled from their normal work to help put together a response team for the jurisdiction in which they work. I can say that that, that was true for myself and many people in my program in TB. As I mentioned, airborne diseases manage the same as any other airborne disease, whether it's tuberculosis or COVID. You're wearing an N95 respirator. You're trying to deliver health services with a person that is in respiratory isolation. You're trying to get services to people that are homebound while they're in isolation. And that's something that we do in tuberculosis prevention and control every day. That is the nuts and bolts of what we do year in and year out. So that knowledge base was very instrumental in putting together COVID-19 response teams across the United States and probably throughout the world because the expertise for isolation and healthcare service delivery and wraparound services, social support services with people in isolation is something that we know a lot about and how to do that. Yeah, there's so much to talk about with TB. Um, I do want to thank you, Maureen, for sharing your expertise and time to help educate our listeners on tuberculosis or the white plague or, you know, consumption as it was known way back when. Um, while most of us going to the store and, and living in our communities are probably safe because we have healthy immune systems, um, we need to be aware of this and to be mindful. And so thank you so much for your time. And to learn more about all things infection prevention, be sure to check out www.apic.org. Thanks for listening to The Five Second Rule, produced by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology Staff and the APIC Communications Committee in partnership with Human Factor. Audio tech is Blake Alfin.